All right, let's do it then. Final Fantasy fourteen documentary by No Clip, part one of three. Going to do all of it in one day. It's going to be glorious. Okay, no pausing challenge accepted. Okay. Square is buried deep into the culture of Japan. Originally a spin-off from Masafumi Miyamoto's father's powerline construction firm, for over 30 years its games have helped power the rise of Japanese games development. There are no shortage of games that live under the Square Enix banner, but none as big as Final Fantasy. From our Western perspective, there's an air of mythos around the company. The accepted truth behind the series' title is that it was named Final Fantasy as it was Square's make-or-break game to avoid oh. impending bankruptcy. And even I failed the speedrun. Uh, I have an interesting story kind of similar to that as well, actually, with my WoW guild. So they call it Final Fantasy, right? As like, this is our final try to try and make the company work. Okay. They're like, all right, final, final, like last ditch effort, Final Fantasy, right? Interestingly enough, that is exactly what I did. So you could put me on the same level as Square Enix here. Okay. It, during Shadowlands, I was trying to save Shadowlands for me. Right, uh, Shadowlands was beyond saving as an expansion for WoW. Right, uh, everyone was leaving. You know, content drought. We had, uh, I think, the longest patch of all time in WoW history, um, being the first patch. Um, everyone started leaving the game. People gave up on WoW because it was two bad expansions in a row. And usually the trend was one good, one bad, one good, one bad, one good, one bad. Everyone gave up on Shadowlands, and uh, me included. And I was streaming at the time, right? And I, I was like, I couldn't find anything in the game to do. So I made, uh, I made what is now, I actually just quit raiding like last week and I gave away the GM title of my Mythic Raiding Guild that I made in Shadowlands. And I called the guild Saving Grace. And everyone shat on me for the name because they're like, what a shit name? And I was like, this is going to be the Saving Grace. Like same as Final Fantasy. It's like, this was the Saving Grace for Shadowlands. This was like my, I could have called it like, I was going to gonna go between like either Hail Mary or saving grace, right? Like it's the saving grace of Shadowlands. And it turned out to be true. It it was the saving grace of Shadowlands. Like, you know, we, we made a guild, uh, we assembled a team, we actually got a raiding roster together, we cleared some cutting edge content on a two-day schedule. It's pretty good, and it actually worked. Like the name was true. Same with Final Fantasy. Interesting random anecdote, but kind of relevant to me. And we're only 52 seconds in, so this is gonna be a good this is gonna be a good video. <laughs> Even if the real answer has more it's to do with name. creating an acronym that so can too. be pronounced by both Eastern my and Western audiences, it. it's that first story that gets told. That's the legacy of this series. Stories about adventures that get passed from generation to generation. As nearby as the arcades of Akihabara and as far as the playgrounds of Europe. As the Final Fantasy series has moved from numeral to numeral, there have been high points and low. But with each new game comes the promise of a new story a new myth. The story of what happened with Final Fantasy XIV is one such myth. What we know about it comes from they old get so reviews, much archive content. message board so threads, much and through conversations with those who were there. The reason for this is that the original version of Final Fantasy XIV doesn't exist anymore. Unlike the vast Nuked. majority of other old games, there is no way of playing it. It was redacted, painted over. Where once stood a game that threatened to sink the Final Fantasy brand forever, now stands the second most popular subscription MMO in the world. And as the years pass us, the- Is it just WoW that's ahead? It must be, right? It has to be WoW. But I don't think it would be by that much, right? I think because of classic WoW, WoW will still be ahead. Um, but not by that much. I think if it was just based on retail, I would uh, probably say Final Fantasy might be the most popular. But um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe it would still be slightly behind. I'm not sure. Myth of that original version and its incredible redemption story strange. are at risk of disappearing. How did it all happen? How did the same studio that shipped a broken mess turn it all around in two years? Why did they make the decision to keep the old version still alive while secretly working on a brand new game? And how did they manage to that make all of this the actually. redesign and rebirth Yo! part of the oh, game's wait, lore? We George. knew this was a story worth telling, not only for those who were there to see it all go down, but for the millions of you who have never heard about this, who never knew the extraordinary lengths the development team went to to save this game. Hype so we Thank did just guys. that. Pack your bags, friends. No clip is heading to Tokyo. Let's fucking go. I want to go to Tokyo one day now. 
because of this documentary. Cat Jam. Three part series. So much to react to, guys. Oh, yeah. Nice slander. Death and rebirth of Final Fantasy XIV Online. Ooh. Ooh. Sheesh. You did, Jared, yeah. <laughs> Dolmond! There's a big boy in there! There's a big boy in there! No! Limsa! Is that Limsa? Yo, little arc, what's up? Welcome. Oh, yeah! Mage man. It's time. Wait, what what is the what is what is the moon called? Is it not Dalmond? <laughs> no! Dead. Dalamud. Oh, Hello, I thought it was Dalamud. Welcome to Shinjuku, Tokyo, home of Godzilla, restaurants full of <laughs> dancing robots, and Square Enix, one Sorry. of the most prolific video game companies in the world. For the past few months, I've been playing catch up with this story, playing the latest version of the game, oh talking to players, and watching community retrospective series like the Speakers Network's fantastic fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> My goal to make sure we asked the right questions when we sat down with the team. During our time here in Godzilla. Shinjuku, we're going to talk to everyone from the engineers who worked on the original game to localization leads, community managers, and even the he CEO like of the company. All to allow them the opportunity to tell their side Giga of Chad. this fascinating Certified. story. Certified the fall Giga and Chad. rise of Final Fantasy XIV happened in real time in front of millions of people around the world. But we wanted to know about this story from an entirely new perspective. From inside the corporate machine that made it happen. That led to its terrible launch and ultimately its incredible rebirth. They did a really fucking good job. My name is uh, Taking something shit. Um, Making it I good. the English localization lead for Final Fantasy XIV. And my middle name being Koji, it's not something I gave myself. It's a, a name my father gave me. My father was stationed- This uh, is Koji! For two years in the Navy when he was young. Went back to the States. This is the guy who makes the quests, right? In uh, ARR, and he puts, all, he puts in all the jokes and stuff. Is this him? This is Koji? Another Giga Chad. Damn! He's the base translator. Oh, nice. Lead writer translator. He does the funnies. Oh, yeah. Damn. Every dev's a giga, giga chat. It's, it's kind of hilarious. because It's like the opposite to wow. <laughs> Every dev is like, we fucking hate this guy. The, well, I mean, people like the old devs, right? In wow. Um, you know, you got like Chris Metzen, the truest giga chat, the realist, the, you know, the realist of the real there. The only guy who still works at Blizzard because he left and came back. And then you've got like most of the rest of the team have like either been involved in scandals or had to leave because of scandals. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, rip Blizzard. Not 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 a good look for you there, buddy. Not a good look. Let's uh let's continue or we'll we'll never get through this. We're five minutes in. Your boy Koji on screen. Mom had me. Um, they wanted to give me a Japanese name. The family was having none of that, <laughs> so they kind of snuck it in the middle name. But then that's they cool though. Me Koji, and right. so I guess the you know the joke was on the rest of the family. He said know, the goat. My dad, being in the navy, didn't really learn a lot about Japan other than he really liked Japan, but he didn't learn any of the language. So I always knew that. My name was Japanese, but beyond that, I really didn't know anything about Japan. But there was always that little seed in there. And then when I got into high school, 
there's a Japanese class, and I like games. Oh, they make games in Japan. Hey, let me study Japanese. If I study Japanese, I can play all those cool Japanese games that yeah, they, never come out over in America. And it kind of just snowballed from there. Uh, when I graduated from high school, um, I took a trip to Japan for three weeks. Oh, this is cute. Homestay type of thing, and I fell in love with it. And during that period, I got to visit a lot of schools um, and a lot of English classes in those schools. And I thought, wow, I could probably do, I know English, I could do this, this will be <laughs> oh, easy. Oh, he seems so cute. Um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but I He's very studied wholesome. a couple years at a, at a university in America, then transferred over to Japan, started over four years at a university in Japan. Wow. Got my teaching license and uh, yeah. It's hard work. There you go. Teacher. Yes, I, I mean, I loved it, but I mean, it was very draining. And that's why pretty much after you'd go to school six in the morning, for morning basketball practice because I was the basketball coach because as my principal said, hey, you're tall. You're the basketball coach. <laughs> then you get into classes. Tall guy gets the basketball job. Hey, we've heard it before. Yep, that's just how it goes. Yeah, it's kind of nice though. It's super wholesome. Like, uh, just like a nice little story. It's just like, yeah, really like Japan. I'm going to go there. I feel like a lot of people get, either they completely kind of like, I don't know, they never really look in that direction or they like really into Japan. I feel like there's there's not too much like in between. People look people generally from from my experience are like really into Japanese stuff and they go there quite frequently and they're like really into like all of the culture and all of the you know, like media and games and stuff like that or they're just completely like steer completely out of the way of it. There's like not too many in between. Like for me, I, I guess you could say I was pretty in between, like, but I never really like took a big interest in it, right? It's like, I, you know, I played like, I watched a couple anime, I, I played played some Pokemon, that was about it. Never really thought to think like about where it came from and anything like that, room. Really. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'd definitely like to visit though. I, I, I've never, it's never really been like one of my places to go, which is like on a bucket list or something, but I think recently I'm, I'm a bit more like, mm, could be cool, like, Especially, I think they have a fan fest in Japan as well, right? Like next year sometime. All the cool pop, uh, pop up store, stores, restaurants. Yeah, and I think like this is a, it's quite like street street food is big over there and stuff as well, right? Like uh, I've seen a lot of those videos on YouTube where they're just like doing the street food, but like mass produced kind of thing, and it's really impressive how they make it. <laughs> You're in December, very nice. Yeah, I'd like to uh, I'd like to go there. Imagine like going there and doing some like IRL streams or something. That could be cool. I mean, I'd have my homeroom class, then I'd have, you know, six or seven other classes teaching. Then you'd have after school, all of a sudden it's, oh, there's after school basketball. Definitely. And then you'd get home and you'd correct. So I was really, you know, always at school every day. It was very draining. And I would go home and I would play FF11. It was how I was able to relax. Oh. Being able to go into my little room and FF11. And put on Enjoy my headphones it. and, you know, get into that world of Vanadio was something that helped me. To escape. Think from the stress and then it just happened to be you know one day i was online you know checking for 11 related information and i saw that square enix was hiring looking for a translator and it just kind of wow that would be really cool that is cool you did it a lot todd did you Koji kill um, wasn't alone. did you kill uh what's that fucking boss i keep forgetting the name virtuous associate <laughs> That's not absolute virtue. <laughs> absolute virtue. Did you kill it, Todd? Not too many people did, I guess. Apparently the hardest video game boss of all time. I've done a react to it. It should go up uh, maybe next week. Storge. Storge. Sorry, guys. Final Fantasy XIV was launched in 2010, Yo, Bunko, but the story of this Hello. game starts eight years earlier with the launch of Final Fantasy XI, Square's first MMO, the early days of online. Many of the team who worked on XIV started on XI. One of those was Kasuga-san, who joined the company in 1999 to build the network infrastructure for this fledgling MMO. Because this is one of the first MMOs, right? Yes, it was one of the first console for sure. So, at that time, the first time I played PlayStation 2, I played the first time I played the first time I played the first time on the PlayStation platform, it was the first time I played the first time. と、プレイステーション 
本当にネットワークの下の部分、まあ、今だとあんまり誰も書かないようなところを書くっていう担当で入社してました。まあ、あの EU に関して言うとね、まあ、スクエアニックスっていいますか、スクエアが初めて、まあ、オンラインのあれだけの規模の、まあ、あの MMORPG、日本でやるっていうのは、本当初めてだったんで、うん okay. いや、もうあの、正直、いろんなことがありましたよ、当時ね、こんなん言っちゃっていいのかな、言っちゃっていいの<笑><笑><笑>いいんだ<笑>、まずね、どういうことがあったかというと、うん、まあ、あの時はあの MMO とかね、海外で例えばウルティマとか、そういったあの、まあ、基本的に PC ですよね。だから今週まででやるなんてもう無謀の極みだとかってねもうたくさんそういうふうに言われましたまあソニーさんがあの PS2 のあの<笑>あのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあのあ This is the dumbest shit, dude. My fucking next door neighbors had a PlayStation. They all the way. They, all right, they had a PlayStation 2. And for like the first year that they had a PlayStation 2, they didn't have a memory card, okay? So they could never save their game. So they would start a new game every day. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they wanted to play their fucking PlayStation, they would start a new fucking game. <laughs> like every day. So they were like, they were, it was basically like speedrunning, kind of, because they would, they would just like, they would try and get further every day than they got the previous day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> in the faster time, and sometimes they would like leave it on overnight so that the game wouldn't wipe because they wanted to pick it up the next day. I was just like, bro, just get a fucking memory card. <laughs> I remember the day they fucking got one, they were like, game changer, dude. Absolute life changer, man. It's so different. I'm like, no fucking shit. What do you think they're for? <laughs> Holy fuck, man. I completely forgot about that. That's the dumbest shit, man. That is so fucking stupid. Yeah, the rumble pack as well. Yeah, you had like plug in rumble packs. Dude, and, and the N64 with all the little plug ins you could get for the controller, like the Game Boy, uh, you put the Game Boy game in the back and stuff. Yeah, good times, man. Good times. There was some like plug in I had on the front of my Nintendo 64 as well, where like it had like a slot at the front. Wait, let me find a picture. N64. How much are these worth now? 70 pounds? I feel like they should be worth more. What a banger console, by the way. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so like here, you could like take off this little slot. And, and I remember you could put something in here, but I don't remember what it was. It was like, was it like an, was it like a hard drive or something? It was like a little grate. It had like a little grate on top. I, I kind of like the controller on this. It is definitely fucking weird looking back on it. But I mean, you basically didn't use the, what's this called? The D-pad? You basically didn't use the D-pad anyway, right? You were just like, Throw your thumb over to click it or like move your hand across. But yeah, I guess it is kind of impractical. But you had the little like trigger button and stuff as well. That was a RAM expansion. Yeah, I think we had it for like, was it Perfect Dark? The Perfect Dark on this console was a banger though. Oh, look at these games. <sighs> What do we have? Pokemon Snap, Quake. Uh, what's that? Fighter Destiny? I don't know that one. Mortal Kombat, Zelda Majora's Mask, Pro Skater 2, Turok. I had Turok. Donkey Kong 64 had Bad, Bad Fur Day. I played at Friends House. Pokemon Stadium was a banger. Mario Kart was a banger, of course. Banjo Kazooie, Resident Evil, Mario Party, Pokemon Snap again. Can't believe Perfect Dark's not on there. That was a banger game. Uh, still holds up today. Yeah, I imagine just graphically it gets let down a little bit, right? But other than that, I think it's probably still in decent nick. I probably, I think we probably still have two Nintendos in my parents' house somewhere. And like some PlayStation 1s. We, we definitely have my GameCube somewhere. We probably have my PlayStation 2 somewhere. I don't remember ever getting rid of them. So I have my Game Boy Advance SP in my room right now. Game, Game Boy Advance was a banger as well. That's a good one. Yeah, we probably have like some PS1s, some, the original Xbox probably still kicking around in my house.、Um, we have a couple 360s, old and new. I think my brother has a PS4 
four or three. I can't remember. But I stopped. I stopped my console journey at 360 because mine broke. It got the red ring of death. Then I sent it off. Got it fixed. It came back, and then um, like the CD reader broke. So <laughs> I used it like this for ages, like years, honestly. Like you put in a CD, right? Like a disc, and it couldn't read it. Like it wouldn't spin up. Uh, but it only needs to spin up for like 30 seconds to read the game and then it would like be okay if you if you installed the game onto it and it would only need to spin up for like 30 seconds right so what i did is uh you had to like eject and then put it in and then as as it was trying to read i had to drum like this on onto the top of the xbox and um it would it would sometimes take like five tries or something like that but i had to do that like right above where the cd was in the in the xbox right and it would like knock the reader into like moving because it wouldn't move by itself but it would like it would like give it like a kick start and then it would read the disc and it would play completely fine it, it would literally like play perfectly um i think i only scratched one disc doing that and it was black ops so i, I bought a new copy of course but yeah, I had to drum on top of it, like at a perfect, like, like had to be in like perfect sync. And you had to get the, the rhythm right. It was like learning how to drum. Like you had to get the rhythm right. And uh, yeah, then it would, uh, it would work. It would literally fix the Xbox, but it was fucking annoying to do, especially if you wanted to play late at night because <laughs> you could just hear it. It's like, oh, he's playing Xbox again. We just fucking smashing on the top of my Xbox 360. Uh, but I couldn't be bothered to go buy a new one. So, like, I mean, it worked, right? Like, it worked with a little bit of drumming. So, why would I go buy a new one? You know, the old top taparino. It just works. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, how to get around those kind of issues. One before, I remember purchasing the PlayStation 2 broadband unit because yeah, the they were all sold out. I ended up paying double on like some Yahoo auction or something like Xbox that. Xbox had the same with the plugin. Ridiculous, but I had to play it. We got a new internet connection. We were on a regular modem at that time, but because you know we needed we needed a new modem, we had to upgrade to ISDN 128. You know, <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely worth it. It was something that was I mean, completely new to me. But for PS2, know, this game actually doesn't look and bad. Ever since then, I've you know been into MMOs. It was that was the gateway drug for me. You know, going in from FF11 and then trying wise. you know some of the Western MMOs as well, getting into World of Warcraft, seeing the differences. Um, between the two. Personally, I think it's very different. Did they ever take it off PS2 and move it to like, like because of hardware limitations? So they like upped it up the graphics and took it away from PS2 or anything like that. I think they they limit how how much graphics they put in the game right because of console hardware right there. They let the console bottleneck so they don't make the PC version like really really good. I mean here in Japan from the Western market because, yeah. It is for everyone it, uh, in the globe. I mean, it's very first uh, MMORPG on the console, PlayStation 2. Yeah, that's a and huge also, barrier to I overcome, mean, it actually, was the putting on first console. ever cross-platform MMO between PlayStation 2 and uh, Xbox 360. The obvious one is the most Japanese people don't really like to speak, I mean, chat in public. Right. So, I mean, in that the world, sense. there's a lot of characters, but it's very quiet. Because people are telling oh, they using whisper. a, a tell instead of the say or shout, and then, but if you want, if you go to the Western world, game world, I mean, everyone, every single one is shouting around. It. So yeah, that's a huge <laughs> you know, while in the West, you know, you have your just are like looking for tits, any tits around, <laughs> and they're just like, they're just like, yo, want to go run the dungeon? Intel's, <laughs> it's so fucking different. <laughs> Uh, tits is the answer. Tits is the answer. Any boobas? <laughs> Limsa, I'm looking at you. I'm about to air some really personal family drama to all these strangers. <laughs> Honestly, you're not far off. Let me trauma dump in my MMO. Let me trauma dump in my MMO, all right? Just don't listen. Let You read it. That was your choice, all right? You didn't have to read it, did you? EverQuest and you had your Ultima Onlines. In Japan, there was none of that. And then, so Final Fantasy XI was really one of the first uh, MMOs in Japan. And so getting to work- So he's been translating with, since all this time. The pioneers of the Japanese MMO um, was really exciting. 
On the other hand, I mean, you could also say that it was possibly kind of a curse in the sense that um, so wait. they were all, you know, doing their own thing. They Is Koji the reason why I have to read Mayhap every fucking two seconds? Koji. Mayhap, you doth do this and pray that happens. Thal's balls. Yeah, we, we had our first Thal's balls uh, a couple of days ago as well. Almost definitely, yeah. Pray tell us this. Had their vision of what an MMO should be and what a Japanese MMO should be. Um, and then me, again, not having played an MMO before, getting on this team and thinking, okay, this is an MMO and translating away and working in that project. I kind of, you know, started thinking, okay, this is what an MMO is, this is what an MMO is. And then that one day I start playing WoW and it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Seeing the differences between oh, the two. Oh, wait, I'm saying, did he okay, get converted? What I thought was the norm in Final Fantasy XI, you know, the grinding for oh, 20 hours death. to go up one level losing and XP. then only to have your level drop when you, you yeah. know, pull too many crabs and it kills you and you've lost five hours work. Like, I thought that was normal. And then he's like, well, that's not normal, is it? The Japanese, well, that was normal uh, at the time. Base game, Final Fantasy XI had already I think really WoW, WoW was the pioneer in that sense. Like, uh, I think WoW was the first game that that hardcore aspect of like losing XP when you die and stuff like that went away. Like, uh, it became more like player friendly quality of life in that sense, right? Like the norm at the time was lose XP. Like EverQuest had that. Probably some others had that as well. Yeah, losing XP. Like when you when you look back on it now, it sounds really dumb. But like at the time that was normal. And then WoW was like, what if we just don't do that? And I think they were a bit like shitting the bed about it, weren't they? When when they released it, they're like, you know, the MMO community might not like this because we're kind of shaking things up here by by adding in this this uh system where you just where it's completely different to anything that's been done before. And everyone's like, wow, that makes so much sense. It's so much nicer. <laughs> so like, all right. And now everyone's like, right, let's take stuff that WoW's done, you know, or early WoW, maybe not recently. <laughs> yeah, not hardcore enough. Not hardcore enough for me. I like pain. It's weird because that is probably the first time, like, it, it just shows. Nowadays, the mentality of Blizzard is to waste your time, which is so ironic because they were like the first MMO didn't waste your time when it came to like the losing XP and stuff like that. Like they were like, all right, let's make it so that people don't have to invest as much time to play this game. And now it's completely the other way around where they completely abuse your time and take advantage of you, right? Don't respect it. Interesting. And they were working on the first expansion pack, uh, Rise Considered of Zalart. Casual I was part of the <laughs> team that was working to get um, the base game and Rise of Zalart all translated before the Japanese Rise of Zalart was finished, so we could all release at the same time. Right? Did you get it on time? I got it on time. I haven't missed. I haven't missed a deadline yet. That's, that's the one thing I'm proud of. Final Fantasy XI was a huge than I. success for Square Enix. I didn't even start stream on time. user base of around a quarter of a million players for years. It was the most profitable Final Fantasy game ever, and at one stage was the sixth most popular game on all of Xbox Live. More than that, it established I'm the Japanese style of I'm surprised I never heard about MMO. it. And when the decision was made in 2005 to start work on a sequel, I think the I new MMO played it, was built around things that made Eleven successful, focusing, like Ooh. most Final Fantasy games do, on beautiful graphics and an interesting battle system. This new game was to be Yo, directed in Purdue I think I've on seen beautiful that. graphics. I think I had that model in Final Fantasy XIV just the other day. Like, this exact axe. <laughs> it's interesting because <coughs> I don't... I don't feel like I ever heard of Final Fantasy XI. Like, you guys told me about it like two or three weeks ago. And I was like, what, Final Fantasy XI is an MMO? Like, I just didn't know about that. I didn't know there had been another MMO before 14. Just straight up. Either it, either I just didn't, never knew or it slipped my mind. But I feel like if I'd have discovered it back in the day, I probably would have played it back then because I used to love the Final Fantasy games back, back at the, around this time. I would probably have played this and um, maybe I would have still got into WoW, but... The fact that this was on console, like I never knew this was on like Xbox 360. Like I hundred percent would have would have played it. Like if I would go back in time now, I would definitely do that. You played it for twenty years. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Jesus Christ! And an interesting battle system. This new game was to be directed and produced by the same duo that shipped Eleven series veteran Hiromishi Tanaka and Nobuaki Komodo. 
Final Fantasy XIV was announced for Windows and PlayStation 3 in 2009. But yeah, behind the cool scenes, the development this. team was struggling to put the pieces of its new world together. ま、最終的にそれが問題だったと考えているものっていうのはその最初のコンセプトとしてそのプランナーがスクリプトを書くことによってと、ゲームを作っていこうって、ま、リテントしてはま、プランナーが考えて自分たちでリソースするんで、と
uh, distract people from the fact that the battle <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> At a fundamental level, the piecemeal design of the game was causing oh, shit. problems. Graphics Yo. were inconsistent. While many elements of the world were copy and pasted ad nauseum, some like, You can see it's Gridania, but it looks like a, like a very, very, very early render, like a blueprint of it, you know? <laughs> Old Gridania. Oh, is that why it's called that? Mm. Makes sense now. Dude, Koji seems to be a big brain, man. Like, he saw all this coming and he's like, I'm just a translator. What can I fucking do? <laughs> like, he can only tell them and they'll be like, shut up, you goddamn translator guy. We're the engineers. They probably just like, we know better than you kind of thing, right? It gets worse. Oh, no. Objects had as many polygons and shaders as a character model. The battle system was just confusing. The game didn't have elements <laughs> fundamental to most modern MMOs. Things like jumping, auto attack, and the ability have to jumping? interact with the map <laughs> using a mouse. It had a system that nerfed hardcore players to make sure they didn't level up too fast. The UI was confusing. Crafting was incredibly complex and took forever. And simply, there just attacks. wasn't enough content. The closed beta wasn't going well. They needed more time to fix All right, this problem. Alright, this is based on this. So is the based. open beta was pushed back to within a month before launch. Wow. The team knew there were problems, and they were getting frustrated. まあ、みんなに認識されて自覚させていくっていうのは結構データが始まって製品版が始まってっていう<笑> チーム全体でオフィスのオフィシャルであったわけではないですけれども、開発者の中ではやはりその世に出していこうリティかどうかっていうところは議論があります。Imagine the working environment 1.0 was getting made. Was it just was the mentality that oh we're not like that's like their thing and we have our very own successful thing over here. We're going to just make another one of those. Right. And uh, that's really what it felt like. Did they start working on ARR before 1.0 even came out? They were just like, alright, this is literally gonna be shit. Let's just start now. Okay, okay, okay. Good god, that, that would have been crazy. But yeah, like imagine the fucking work environment, just like everyone's just there like, guys, it's a month to release and this game's fucking dog shit. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that was your OGP, right? So we're gonna find the Giga Chat in a minute. Alright, we'll keep going. Like, is that we're going to continue doing what we did because it succeeded before. Why wouldn't it succeed again? And seeing that direction, you know, them taking that direction and knowing that, you know, having worked on 11, that yes, they were very successful. Seeing the success that they had with Final Fantasy 11, seeing these great creators, you know, creating something that was, I mean, revolutionary. Um, but then on the other hand, knowing that what they were doing was, yeah, but maybe that might not, that worked six or seven years ago, but a lot of things have changed since then. And I mean, I think there was even one guy on the localization team uh, that got to that point where he just got so frustrated that he just wrote this scathing mail and sent it out to the whole team before telling anyone else on localization he was going to write it. And then we all get it at the same time, the devs team, we're reading, it's like, wow, this is really terrible. I hope he doesn't, oh, he sent it to the whole team. <laughs> because he just got really frustrated because he could, to him, I mean, they were being very stubborn. They weren't, um, you know, they hadn't moved on. Whereas the rest of the world had moved on and, uh, and adapted. Um, you Everyone know, started playing WoW. Well. And, and what they had done. Whereas, you know, the team here was like, no, we're going to stick with what we know. And that's good enough. Then start right. feeling more yeah. so it literally happened, more like concerning the situation. I mean, this is not fixed, not fixed, not fixed. Oh, then, oh, you announced the launch date, but it's not fixed. So, yeah, but still, the, some major portion of people are. Arrogant devs. And now it's like the devs try and voice their concerns and the shareholders like make it shit. That we don't care. Make some more money this way. It's fine. Just ship it as it is. Too many resources. All right. We'll just put in a fucking couple microtransactions. Something like this. 
And, uh, you know, we'll make our money that way. It's fine. We can, we can have the game not, not be that good anyway. Now, now, the, now the devs are like, we want to make it better, you know? Like, at least, wow, that's the case. Arrogant devs, yeah. So they were just like, ah, it's good enough, bro. It's fine. It's like everyone else is like, please, no, please. Hear, hear us out. See some reason. <laughs> still thinking, still be uh, believing. No, 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 it's, believing? It's better. Still better. better phase, last phase, but still better. So it could be. I mean, uh, fixed or the change at the launch timing. So. It kind of went from thinking, okay, this project's going to be great, to, uh oh, there might be some problems. Can we get? Can we fix them? Can we fix them? <laughs> okay, we can't fix them. <laughs> Is there anything we can do? Uh, I don't know. Sinking ship. No. It was yeah. It was a very taxing experience. Oh, that'd be really sad, man. The team crossed their fingers and hoped that the game's beta problems were simply that. The same issues that most MMOs cool. have. Ones that could be fixed with patches Papa once Limo. the game entered live operations. And so Final Fantasy XIV Online launched on September 30th, 2010. Like it sold here. well its first week and after a month had over 600,000 players swarming into its world. But it didn't take long for the cracks Wait, to appear. Concerned? The problems in the beta were echoed by new players. Oh, the game was boobs. sluggish, the servers crashed, and the Orzeans quickly ran out of things to do. Quests were limited, and the fatigue system even made grinding for Yo, that cast time, holy shit. Critics ate it alive, too. Let's get right down to it. Unless you've got the patience of Job or some kind of masochist, you shouldn't <laughs> play Final Fantasy XIV. Its problems are so <laughs> vast that I could spend hours talking about them. The awful interface, no, sure. the recycled content, the stringent limits on questing, the useless maps, if the you're a masochist, word, maybe. <laughs> these issues and dozens more constantly have you asking that age old question what were they thinking? From GameSpot as well, which is like pretty like high so, reputation. What was it like seeing public reaction? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very, I mean, very disheartening um, because. You know, you'd want to you'd yeah, you look at those and you'd want to say, no, no, they don't understand. They don't know, you know, what's going on here or, or, you know, but deep down, you'd know they were right. And that was Damn, what kind man. of, you know, that's rough, that dagger in your heart and it's twisty because, you know, you want to defend what you worked on. I mean, yeah. the people that I worked with are the greatest people. They're, I mean, I still want to be proud you know, of what you put out there, them. right? I had worked with them before in FF11. I consider them. Not but you know, you'd be objectively wrong. Um, but. You know, and then you see people on online, you know, bashing the work they did. And I know how hard they worked. I know how many hours they put in. I know that like, it like having haters is one thing, but like sitting there and defending something that you yourself believe is shit. Oh, man, that's rough. In the last three or four months, people were basically living um, at work, all putting their 100 percent into this. It game really tries, you know, destined to <laughs> kind of crash and burn but and then to have people online just say oh that sucks this person is a piece of shit and their work is terrible it it hurts but it hurts that, more that because would beat me the fuck up if to be i honest. was not here and was a user and had played that game i probably would have said the same thing so this yeah で、まあ、あの、オペレーション上のね、トラブルとかっていろいろタップがあるっていう。まあ、これあの、ある程度 あの、相当大丈夫かなというのをま、ローンチした後ね、え、やっぱりそこはね、あの、非常にリアルに感じましたね。それはそうですね。ま、ローンチして、ま、しばらく経って、ま、そんなにいないっていうんじゃなかったです
um, because the more you say it, the less weight it has. But mm -hmm. Japan, being a very or a company or a country where you know people apologize a lot, that's part of the culture. But then trying to translate that, it's like, okay, this is the tenth time I've said sorry in this one post, and yeah, then from you know, doesn't translate myself, across like, yeah, to people the are going to look world. at it as insincere. You know, the yeah. more you apologize, the more insincere. And then trying to explain that to the team, it's like, no, we have to apologize. It's like, yes, you have to apologize, but and it just became we weren't one talking big about apology. The game anymore. We were talking about how to translate apologies, and it seemed like that lasted for you know a couple months. Actually, we see a huge drop. I mean, after right after the launching, launch timing, we got a. Uh, some I mean, good number of the subscribers again that fall fall I mean as you can imagine so I mean it was failure and we announced a failure so we see uh, lots of decline. さっきも話した通り実際にはその開発内でもその今リリースできたっていうかリリースできるクオリティがあるかっていうのはこうまあベータ直前とかベータが始まってもそうなんですけど常に疑問はあったのでとまあリリースして実際にその it's like I get their intention. They were like, okay, we can fix it later, we'll fix it over time, kind of thing, but it was too deep rooted, the problems, right? The problems were like way too deep rooted. And even what he's saying there about like delaying the launch. Realistically, how long will they have had to delay the launch? They would have probably had to delay it by like at least a year or something, right? Um, to maybe fix some of this stuff. It's not like and back then as well, like I don't think delaying launches was really a thing, right? Like remember when I think it was like Cyberpunk was like one of the first, at least in recent times that I can remember when they delayed Cyberpunk and everyone was like losing their fucking mind. Did they delay Cloud WoW Classic or was it Shadowlands they delayed? I think they delayed Shadowlands for WoW as well. And that was only by like two months and that wasn't enough time either. And that was obviously because of COVID and stuff like that. But I think like the social, it was like almost like social suicide for your game to to to, to announce like a delay. And especially if they were going to delay it by like at least a year or something. So they're basically doomed if they did and doomed if they don't at this point, right? It's it, Honestly, it's it makes it even more amazing that they revived the game from this state. Because usually it would just be a complete write-off. You know, you failed, rip, go again next time. The fact that they somehow, somehow like rallied together enough people to like give it a chance and revive it is like really, really amazing to be honest. Which I guess is what we're gonna learn about in the rest of the documentary. But like when you think about it just now at like a surface level, like the fact that they achieved that is like crazy. Like I don't think I've ever heard of anything similar. Once you have the product out there, it's much easier to like slack off about it, right? You know, you can be like, oh yeah, we'll try and get this in for next patch. And if you don't quite make it, it's like, oh, well, we'll do it for next patch. That's what WoW's been coping on for years now. It's like, oh, we'll rework this class uh, soon, guys. And then it's like, yeah, we didn't quite get it fixed for this expansion. Oh, it's going to be too big of a job to do it mid-expansion because we've got other stuff to work on. So wait till next expansion and it will be fixed. And it's like, that's two years, bro. I have to play this class in a shit state which you've agreed to shit and want to rework for another two years before you fix it. Like, huh? その根本的に対応しなきゃいけないっていうところは、と、チーム内に割とすぐ広がったと思ってます。なので、特にすごいそんなことはないっていう意見がすごく強くあって、誰かを説得しなきゃいけないみたいなことは特に。Except the devs. Today, Square Enix is based across multiple floors in a modern office complex in Shinjuku, Tokyo. It's a company that is often designing multiple projects at once. And while Final Fantasy XIV was being developed, in another part of the building a different game was being made. Produced by a Final Fantasy fan, his name? Naoki Yoshida. Your yeah, boy! US Let's go! Entertainment System. No, Mario Brothers. が一番最初にプレイしたゲームです。とにかくその、テレビの中、テレビっていうのはその<笑> 
見るものだと思っていた子どもの時にところがそのマリオブラザーズで初めてそのコントローラーを握ってゲームをプレイした時にまずそもそもテレビのものを自分が自由に動かせるっていうことがものすごいショックで友達の家でプレイさせてもらったんだけどあのものすごい興奮したのを覚えてますね。ドラゴンクエストっていうあの日本で RPG を、まあ、大きく広めたタイトルを初めて触った時にアクションではないゲーム数字のやり取りでこんなにまたさらにゲームは面白くなるんだっていうのを特にストーリーラインがあってっていうまた次のカルチャーショックを受けて RPG っていうジャンルにものすごくあのなんだろうフォーカスしていくことになったかなとは思います。当然その翌年にに出たフファァイナルファンタジーにもその映画的なその演出ファンタジーをより強く打ち出したっていうところにもすごい衝撃を受けてたのでやっぱり僕の中で「ドラゴンクエスト」と「ファイナルファンタジー」っていうのはすごい大きかったですね当時。Like most Japanese players at the time, Yoshida san played all the early Final Fantasy games. He holds them in high regard, though he still holds the bitter memory of、I、not、am. being able to save before、Dragon、the last、Quest. dungeon in Final Fantasy III. But when he was 11 years old, a brand new type of gaming experience arrived at home. His uncle gave him a PC. On this PC, the young gamer learned how to program BASIC. His first video game centered、oh, around、wow. trying to break into a bank vault. But this PC also exposed him to a spectrum of gaming that eluded most Japanese players Western role playing games. He fell in love with games like Diablo and was stunned when he first went online and played with other players. とにかくすげえゲームあるって言われてウルティマンオンラインをベータから始めたのが初めて MMO をプレイした作品でやっぱり同じようなその3回目の衝撃3000人が同時に一つの世界で遊ぶっていうのがもうとてつもないまた衝撃でしたね。まあ、ウルティマは本当に自由度のウルティマオンラインは特にとにかく初期は自由度がめちゃくちゃ高いゲームだったのでそのいわゆるロードの称号をつけたそのなんて言ったらいいんだろうなすごく紳士的なというかコミュニティリーダー的プレイをするキャラクターと完全に悪のプレイヤーキラーをやるキャラクターを2つ作ってどっちもものすごい遊んでた。Oh, やっぱりその MMORPG っていうゲームがどう作られているのかどういったエンジニアリングが必要なのかっていうのもものすごいそこで勉強させてもらったと思いますもうその頃からはコンソールと同じぐらいの比重で PC でゲームをかなり遊ぶようになってたので自分で PC パーツ買ってきて組み立てたりしてたし。でやっぱりそのあたりで FPS もかなりプレイし始めてたし特に 3DMMO のスタートであるエバクエストその後プレイをし始めて当時エバ,エバクエストのパッケージを日本で手に入れるのが本当に大変で出張で東京に来た時に秋葉原をね時間を作ってゾンビのように店をこううろうろしてエバクエストってゲームないですかエバクエストってないですかって。<笑> Oh man, Yoshi P, what a baller. Yoshida san would embark on a career in games that would eventually see him joining Square Enix to work on the Dragon Quest series. Though he wasn't working on the Final Fantasy team, he was part of the Umbrella Group that was allocating programmers to various projects. He's a real he didn't、gamer. have granular visibility on FF14, but he knew the team was struggling. I asked from his perspective as a producer where he thought the game's problems were coming from. <laughs> カットされるのかもしれないけどクリスタルツールって呼ばれるミドルウェアを全社でその作ろうとしていたので腕のいいプログラマーが全部そのチームにあの書くなんだろうゲームラインから招集されてそのメインプログラマーがみんないないっていう状態になってしまったのでどのプロジェクトもものすごい大変な時期だった、まあ、オリジナルの14がああなったでしまったりの一つでもあるかなとは思います、ね、さらに2つ大きな問題がそこに絡まっていてスクエアニックスその全体にプレイステーション2のジェネレーションで本当に世界一クオリティグラフィックスがのクオリティが高いそしてゲームエクスペリエンスがものすごく詰まったゲームっていうのをたくさんリリースしたので
本当にこうなんて言うんだろうある意味自信過剰にもうなっていた時期で自分たちが世界一だし自分たちのグラフィックスこそが世界一だしその作り方は自分たちにしかできないだからなんだろうでも超巨大な成功体験ってやっぱり足かせというかにもなる例だと思うんですけどものすごくおごってた。まあ、悪い言い方をすればおごってた時期だったと思うんですねまず例えるとその刀を作る刀匠のような職人たちが本当にたくさんいて彼らが一つ、so, was he, was he working at square was it square, square enix at this point or not but he was they said he was in the same building but not working on final fantasy right and then they just asked him his perspective and brought him in or... it was square enix right 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 so he worked there but He wasn't on the FF team, yeah. Yeah, he was on Dragon Quest. And then they were just like, yo, can we, can we pick your brain for a minute? <laughs> And then he's like, I will save you. Hold my beer. He was making a lot of things. He was making a lot of things. He was making a lot of things. He was making a lot of t h プレイステーション3の世代になった瞬間にテクノロジーの方がそれを上回るっていう時期が来たせいで作り方を変えようとはしないしだけどテクノロジーも追いつけないっていうことからさらにそれを知ってるはずのプログラマーたちはミドルウェアの制作に行ってるっていう状態ででもグラフィックス作ってる。そのアーティストたちは自分たちの作り方こそが世界一だと思っているので古い作り方で引き続きものすごく負荷のかかるやり方でアセットを作ってたのでもうそれらが絡まってっていうのがまあもう一つの大きなさっき2つあるって言った問題の1つ目がそれですねもう1つはプライドはいついかなる時でもとても大切なものだとは思うんですけどそこにやっぱり超巨大な成功体験をしたっていうこと自体が乗っかってきちゃうとその自分たちの作るゲームこそがベストであって他をあんまり見る必要がないっていう時期でもあったんじゃないかなと思っていて例えば当時世界です多分 MMORPG を知ってる人に世界最大の MMORPG は何ですかって言ったら100人に聞いたら100人がワールド・オブ・オブ・カーストって。But you d- like, for me, ex- for example, I, if I, I would, I literally associate the like,、uh, ac- acronym, I guess, MMORPG, like, I actually associate that with WoW. Because it's just, maybe it's because it's the first one that came into contact with me,、um, probably. But that's like most people's experience. Like, they were like, WoW was like the woke MMO, right? Where people got on board on a much wider base. If, if someone said MMO, like, you know, when you do the word association thing, it's like MMO, I'll be like, wow. Yeah, exactly. MMO mainstream, exactly. You said it perfectly. And it was like, a, again, like, it was like a pioneer in a way of like making MMO more casual friendly, right? I don't play the game. 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 世の中に対して新しいそのビデオゲームをリリースしようとするときにライバルになるタイトルは何だろうとかユーザーは今プレイヤーはどこにそのゲームエクスペリエンスの最大最新の状態をプレイしてるんだろうっていうのを知らないっていうのがその感覚として僕には結構信じられないなんでもっとみんなゲームプレイしないのだって自分たちが今ど,どの辺りにいるか分かんなくなっちゃうよっていうのがまあ言いたいで特に14の場合に。関してはもちろん「ファイナルファンタジー11」の超巨大な成功体験というのが邪魔をしたっていうのもあるとは思うんだけどあの当時は「エヴァークエスト」を徹底的にプレイをしてだからこそ「11」を作ったはずなのに新しいレストランをオープンするときに隣にあるレストランがどんなメニューを出していてどんなサービスをしているかを知らずにレストランを作る回転させる人はいないんじゃないって
Um, so Open that worldwide just at the, the launch stage then of, of 1.0, what was the feeling within Square Enix? The beta was quite close to launch. Were people anticipating that there would be negative feedback or were they less aware that that was going to happen? I guess. ニュースは見ててましたね。ただ、多かれ少なかれ、MMORPG まあ、そうは言っても11のやっぱり完成度が高いので、そこと比較をしてあの機能がない、この機能がないっていう話をしてるのかなっていうふうに思ってた。僕は僕自身の開発が忙しかったのもあって、ただそれもあの、少しずつ
At that time, he was leading a team that was working on an original IP for Square Enix. He was disappointed to leave Wait, that he team, two but positions. excited for the opportunity Giga to chat. work on one of the company's crown jewels, for one, a dude. numbered Final Fantasy game. Holy. So, he got right to work. He literally came in. Oh, you, you got rid of two people? I will take both their spots. Yeah, and I expect both their paychecks too, bitch. Hold my fucking beer while I fix this shit you got yourself into. Lord and Savior, hey, there's a yeah, director and producer. There's a reason why he's the Lord and Savior. で、あとその<笑> で、一度まあ、みんな仕事したことがないから、どんな仕事をする人間なのかを見てくれればいいよって、まず。で、あ、こいつ <笑> もう一回、あの、Man had a vision, dude. Man had a vision. So can another gigachat. リベンジするぞって言ったらガッツポーズした。あ、ダム。ヒーワズオンリーガイ。ああ、ダム。ヒーワズオンリーガイ。ああ、ダム。ヒーワズオンリーガイ。ああ、ダム。ヒーワズオ
he, you know, he asked our opinions. He l laid out a roadmap. Respectable he man. Gave us a vision and a hope. And it, even though it seemed like it would be difficult to achieve, it didn't seem inconceivable. Yoshi P knew there was no time. To the way he voiced it sounded like sounded like he was kind of like, if you don't like this how I run the project, then you can just leave. But he probably was like, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to hear you out. We're going to work together and stuff like that. If you don't like that, then you can leave. He wasn't just like dictating, you know, like we're doing this. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, he said, give me three months. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, and I think that's like, that's a good amount of time to kind of like at least take a direction, right? Get people, get people riled up and get people moving. You got to start that snowball rolling, right? To wait, he worked with corporate to make sure the team had time off, both for them to relax, but also to give him time to build his new vision, to do research yeah. playing other MMOs, and to help draft his plan, to deliver the vision and how the team was going to do it. They had very little time so to we went fix no this life game, on wow. so once they started, the specifications document would have to be watertight, and as captain of the ship, he needed to be able to answer every question the team may have quickly. Yoshida-san was now at the helm of his first Final Fantasy, and as an avid MMO fan, he was looking forward to getting in there and fixing it. What he couldn't have known at this stage was the scale of the job ahead of him, that no matter how much they patched Final Fantasy XIV online, they couldn't ever fix it. What they'd have to do was something that no developer had ever done, to rebuild an entire MMO while the original version was still running. I don't think that they realized immediately that it was something that couldn't be solved. The patches, I think they still believed. It's interesting, actually, like he said there, no one ever did that. They could have just been like, oh, well, we'll just leave 14 to kind of rot and we'll start working on 15, 16, whatever the next MMO game would be, right? Like, I assume 15 would have already been in the works as like a single player or whatever. But like, they could have turned 16 into an MMO or something, right? Like, most people have done that. They were just like, all right, we just that the players did. I wonder. It'll we'll probably tell us in a second, like how they communicated it to their players and stuff. Yeah, like leaving it live and then just people being like, "Oh, well, we know something big's gonna happen." Like, like, do we do we hear them out, kind of thing? Then you gotta get the players on board, right? Us HR to let them play WoW for three months. Give me three months to play WoW. I'm gonna study it, write down all my notes. You know what? You know who'd have been fucking a good pickup for them? Josh Josh Strife Hayes. Dude, imagine recruiting that guy with all of his experience playing all the different MMOs and stuff. He could he could nitpick everything apart. Dude, I bet if Josh Strife Hayes ever made like a game company and wanted to make an MMO, he'd make a fucking banger, dude. Another Giga Chad. Yeah, he is truly. Josh is a true, true Giga Chad. He would make a banger MMO. He would make oh dude, imagine it. We can dream, guys. We can dream. I guess he could be like a uh, freelancer, like outsourced company should like bring him in to like hear his thoughts on things maybe because he's got so much experience under his belt playing so many different games or something. Maybe not working full time for a company, but he could probably quite easily be like a, a go to guy. Yeah, consultant. Exactly. Does Preach do do a lot of consulting stuff? I know he I know he's he's got the thing. He's his fingers in a lot of pies and stuff. Right. But I didn't know if he gets like early access to a lot of stuff to give his feedback as an experienced kind of veteran. I didn't actually know that. Just the lighting guys. That, you know, if we patch it, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until they reevaluated and then brought in, you know, the new blood. Yoshasan came in and told him, OK, yeah, this is not something that can be patched. If we want to fix this, we're going to have to take a drastic step. Yoshida spent seven weeks researching and returned with two options for corporate. It was then he realized that it would be impossible to convert the current game into an MMO that could last the test of time. Ultimately, though, this New was kid. a decision that corporate had to make. So he returned with not one, but two plans. Plan A and Plan B. During this meeting, he explained that Plan A would be to patch the game and make it more playable, but that ultimately the game would never really satisfy players, and though Square Enix may make their money back, the damage to the online brand would be catastrophic. And then, there was Plan B. Plan B, baby. Original Final Fantasy XIV Literally doing 
2つに分けてでどういったそのマネジメントスタイルでそれをやるのかで大体発売時期はプレイステーション3版をリリースするっていうのがプレイヤーとの約束だったので<笑>プレイステーション3の寿命が来る前にリリースしなきゃいけないので2012年年末から2013年中には絶対リリースできるこの計画であればっていうプレゼンテーションをしてリスクは高いただ当然そんなことをしたことはない、yeah. ゲーム業界で<笑> Which has a bad rep. 同じタイトルで作り直してるから成功,成功するかどうかは分からない,ななないただ少なくとも<笑>やっぱり「ファイナルファンタジー」ってクレイジーだねとかすごいことするねとか少なくとも自分たちがミスしたことを認めて信頼を取り戻そうとしたっていう努力は見てくれてる人は多分見てくれるだろうだからどっちをチョイスするかは会社に任せる、oh, ただどっちであっても全力でやるよっていう話をプレゼンテーションし Damn, he must have pitched it perfectly. まあ結果的にはねあのプラン B でって言ってくれたんで今こうなってますけど Quite surprising that they went with it, to be honest. Yeah, let's make. Let's continue working on the game that no one likes while recreating the game that no one likes. And they were like, Yoshida? That's a hell of a plan. That's a hell of a plan, dude. Let's, let's fucking do it. <laughs> yeah, bad game, bad rep. And、uh, let's, let's keep developing it in its current state. And make a new version of it at the same time. Yeah, actually, speech level 100, dude. Yeah, they might have had the view. They were like, you know what? If we pull this off, we're going to look like fucking heroes. And they do. And they did. Yeah, true. If they didn't fix 14. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, b u m b l e b e a v e r If they didn't fix 14, and they just went like, all right, guys, a new online one's coming out. It's called Final Fantasy 16 or 17.、Um, People were like, 14 was fucking shit, mate. I'm not going to play 17. Yeah, so they had to repair the brand. Yeah, that's a really good point. And to be fair, fair play to the, to the directors as well for, for going with it, right? Like, they, they clearly were empathetic to the, the state of, of, like, you know, the franchise and, and the brand and stuff. And they were like, yeah, let's, th this, this does, se does seem like the better, better solution. So, pretty nice. Final Fantasy XIV 1.0、uh, was in、uh, a state of disarray. Square Enix had decided to suspend subscriptions to help ease the negativity around the game, while the PS3 version was indefinitely losing、postponed. money as well. For the next two years, Yoshida san and his team would work tirelessly on not one, but two MMOs, patching the original 1.0 to fans' expectations. While secretly working on a brand new version of Final Fantasy XIV. Secret. In our next episode, we focus on that two year period and tell the incredible story of the falling moon of Dalamud, the death of 1.0, and the birth of a new Eorzea. Oh, yeah, baby, let's fucking go! Subscribe to their Patreon. The Gobu Wall, the great Gobu Wall. That was good. Good first app. <laughs> Alright, how long did that take? That took about 2 hours 15. Wait, was it, was it 25 minutes in we started? I think so, right? No, 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 it wasn't. Was it? Was it? Maybe it was. Good ratio. That's actually not the worst ratio we've had. We've done 6x before. Shorter than your character creations? Yeah, yeah. Next! Alright, alright. But we're listening to the fucking music, boys. So happy, we got two more to go. Two more to go. For a combined total of.、Uh, basically the same again. Basically, another 50.、Uh, this one's this is like an hour and two minutes.